It's time for the VolQuest podcast, where we dissect the biggest news items of the week. Good Tuesday, everybody, and welcome into the Smoky Mountain Organics VolQuest podcast, East Tennessee's most trusted health and wellness store focusing on natural products and organic remedies. Visit three locations in East Tennessee, one right here in Knoxville, 8018 Kingston Pike, across the street from the Trader Joe's. And you can always shop online at SmokyMountainOrganics.com. Uh, fall camp in full blast uh, hit going into this next four day block period here towards uh, now the end of fall camp. Plenty of coverage up at the front page in the GQ. And of course, follow, subscribe, like all that good stuff. Vol Quest on YouTube as when, well. When you, when you were growing up, Kane, did you call it Walmarts and Belks? <laughs> as I mentioned before we hit record, my copy <laughs> said Traders Joe. And so Hammer. I'm Ron Burgundy. I read what's on the copy. Hammer. Austin Price. Beep, beep, beep. Backing <laughs> up over Eric Kane this morning uh, to get this podcast off and running. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Listen, I'm not oblivious to the fact that I stumble over words sometimes, <laughs> but like when people are calling me out on that, I'm like, what are they talking about? Like, seriously. <laughs> Is like, it no. you, don't, you don't think he was channeling his inner Tony Jones there? <laughs> I, I have I have let it go on for weeks. And so I'm not saying anything, but since you've now mm-hmm. made the correction and you're over here grinning as you do it, I'm like, Yeah, <laughs> let's go ahead and have if he's putting his foot down. The copy my has been corrected. My mother in law used to love loves to say, you know, you want to go to Walmart's or Belk's or Really, my my mom my mom puts a K at the end of them. It's the K mark and the wall mark. <laughs> I'm like, where's the K come from? But anyway, that's not why anybody's listening to the podcast. All right, back on some more pressing matters. Uh, fall camp, <laughs> two scrimmages are in the books now. Week three of fall camp, lots going on. Brent Hubs, uh, some some major takeaways, some things to talk about. Josh Heupel met with the media yesterday after scrimmage number two, but it seems like some good work was gotten in, and there's been a ton of players that have been rotating in and out, getting a whole lot of snaps the other day. Yeah, I mean, I think they rotated a ton of guys, and they've tried to limit a few guys as well. Uh, I mean, Jabari Small, you've probably seen enough of him at this point. Don't want to take a chance on an injury there, so I don't think a lot of work there. I don't know that Byron Young's – he's getting enough work, but, I mean, he's not getting wore out in in the scrimmage settings. Um, So they're trying to be cautious with some guys and and make sure they're smart with those veterans as they go into whatever this – third four day block or whatever that is in, in the in the plan uh, of fall camp that, that Josh Heupel and his staff put put together uh in this final kind of push to figure out who can help you and, and who can. I think that's the biggest takeaway is um they've got a better idea but who over these next four days out of that group of guys who got a bunch of reps and the crazy combinations that they played uh on Sunday who in the next four days kind of solidifies that they can help this football team and the coaches are comfortable with them. I I think that's the big step moving forward uh, for this team, Austin. Yeah, I agree. And I I think the biggest thing is just kind of get a feel for who could potentially help you because that can change in the course of the season. I mean, you may get three games in and go, yeah, we gave that kid a shot and it just ain't working. Or As it did a year ago. Yeah, we can't keep trying to fit the round peg in the square hole. Um you know, so I think it's kind of just who do you feel like can can get to the field against Ball State? And I don't mean in garbage time. Tennessee's supposed to win that game by 30 points, right? So, I mean, like, I'm not talking about in the fourth quarter when you're just handing it off trying to get to triple zeros. I'm talking about in the second and third quarter, young guys that you feel like can help you on the field that can do something uh, productive and give you – I'm not talking about 45 or 50 snaps. I'm talking about a productive 15. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think for, for Tennessee, they're trying to figure out, like, what which of those – you know, freshman receivers, you know, do we feel like we can count on? Which of those DBs and at the star position, so on and so forth, do we think we can count on? Elijah Herring continues to have a really good fall camp. He's someone that's definitely going to help Tennessee on special teams, but how much can he help you at linebacker? Um, to me, that only adds to the depth that, at a position that I think Tennessee is, is a little bit better at than they were a year ago. Yeah, and I think, Eric, it gets back to the age-old question. You know, what what is – when does a coach really trust? We, we, we've seen, we, you know, we've seen some guys not play because a coach didn't trust them and they were the most talented guy. And then we've seen um, some other guys who, uh, you know, some coaches are willing to throw guys out there mo- mo- a little more freely than other coaches are. I don't think this, this coaching staff a year ago played some of their young players as fast as, and as early as they should have played them. And we've talked about this, I know, before with Hendon Hooker running a, a, a zone read against Missouri in the fourth quarter with a you know two-plus touchdown lead. 
what does it got to take to really earn somebody's trust? You know, I think that's there's no there's no full blown scrimmages left at, at this point. So how how much can a guy over the next four days earn somebody's trust, and what does that look like for a coach to really be willing to put a guy into a meaningful situation? at Pittsburgh or against somebody in the early part of this season and not just that garbage time against Ball State? Yeah, I mean, I think without getting out there on the field and improving it in a, in a game like setting, which you're still a couple of weeks away, it's it's got to be, you know, we hear these coaches harp on it all the time, stringing together a couple of consistent days of practice, whether that be, you know, the, the phrase Josh Heupel was using the other day, a four-block period, or whether that be one week to another week, you just got to be consistent. And I think that's where some of these players that we're hearing a lot about uh, here in camp so far, the Walker Merrills and and some of these other, you know, the uh, Dylan Sampson early on and, and and some of these other players as well, just consistently showing up to practice, not making the same mistakes, going 100 miles an hour, and that's putting them in positions to get reps and scrimmages and ultimately will get reps in a game-like situation because you're exactly right. They say they want to play more players, but Willie Martinez did not play any players last year. Rodney Gardner's come out and admitted this, you know, I think the question was asked a couple of weeks ago, will you sometimes put a player in a game just to get them some experience? And he, he pretty much said you, you can't afford to do that. So it, it, he said you can't afford to do it in a, a Pittsburgh or an SEC game, but in, yeah. you know, yeah, I guess ball yeah. state maybe, but not but, against. Not yeah. Against I mean, Alabama. Rob, I just, I feel like that's why finishing off camp the right way, being consistent and how you approach the, the day is how, some of these players will gain that trust and then they'll get their opportunities against ball state. And then we'll see from Pittsburgh and then Florida and, and, two weeks after that. And then the and, SEC games and two guys that, that hype mentioned yesterday. And it's not because of inconsistency so much. I, I don't think I, I felt like it was kind of because of injuries. However, what did you, he, I mean, he called out squirrel white and Jimmy Callaway in, you know, in particular, you know, by name, like listed them as like guys that, that, you know, this next block of four days, needed to get on the field and show something. And I, and I don't think it was necessarily because they had been bad. It was because they had not been out there. But I, I felt like, you know, because Callaway is a guy that we, we talk about all the time. And well, for, but he, and he's a guy that Alex Golish, I mean, clearly smacked the inconsistent label on, uh, you know, that, that his most consistent thing in his Tennessee career to this point is he's been consistently inconsistent. And so, I mean, that's the challenge for him. I'll say this for the receiver position. I know Josh Heupel said he didn't know who all that they could trust and the next four days would, would matter there. I got news for him. He's going to play somebody he doesn't trust completely out of the gate here to start this season because he's only got one guy he really trusts, and, and, and that's Cedric Tillman. Outside of that, you guys are just going to have to earn it on the fly because you don't have any other options. And, and just read between the lines because – you know, that's what you have to do with him. I mean, he's 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 mentioned Walker Merrill consistently. Makes me think he's going to play. He he meant, he he was pretty raving about Brew McCoy yesterday. I mean, I don't know how far along he is with you knowing the offense, but those are those are two dudes that, that he's talked about. You know, pretty consistently along with Squirrel White. I mean, those might be the three guys that that Heifel has mentioned the most. What in the what we talked to him three times. Yeah, He's talked to him hard. three times, and and he, here is what Josh Heupel said Monday or Sunday following the scrimmage on the wide receivers, the guys who are showing up consistently, the guys that need to get back in here. Here's that full quote on the wide receivers, specifically the ones opposite of Cedric Tillman and and really Jalen Hyatt. Is it's pretty much not a given, but they feel good about what they got in Jalen Hyatt right now. Uh, I, I do. I thought there were some real positive things today. Um, you know, Brew McCoy did some really good things out there uh, inside of the stadium. I thought he handled and operated really well. Um, you know, was physical with the ball in his hands. Jimmy Holiday made some plays uh, today, some competitive catches, and then run after the catch. Um, you know, Walker Merrill's a guy that's had a really good training camp, much better football player and understanding of what we're doing, you know, from, from where we ended spring ball. I think he's made strides, and he's done that offensively. He's done it on the special team side of it, too. Um, so there's still a ton of competition. Uh, we've had a couple guys that, you know, have missed a day or two here and there uh, through training camp. This next block uh, will be important to see those guys function and operate um, and handle the totality of what we're doing offensively and, and uh, ultimately prove that they deserve to be on the football field and play. Um, you know, and, you know, that's a Jimmy Callaway, it's Squirrel, um, in particular, those two guys. And so you hear right there, AP mentions Brew McCoy by name. Think he made some plays in that scrimmage. That was good for him to get in that scrimmage. Of course, he did not scrimmage uh, the first go around as he was a bit banged up. But 
You know, Squirrel White has showed up during camp, obviously. They like Hyatt. They like Tillman. Mitch and Jimmy Holiday by name. Mitch and Jimmy Callaway. And then Walker Merrill is a guy that's been very consistent at the wide, wide receiver position as those guys try to battle it out to ultimately find some playing time. Yeah, the biggest thing for Brew is, is he going to get eligible, Hubbard? I mean, you know, it, we're, at that, we're at that weird time. And, and you asked that question yesterday. Like, at what point do you become a little bit more concerned about, you know, I, I thought if it wasn't done by the 20th, I thought that was going to be, you know, peak escalation on the concern. Um, and here we are sitting here on the, was that the 16th? So, I mean, I, we're getting close. And, you know, uh, the, the, you know, the sucky part for Tennessee is it's out of their control. Yeah, it is. And I, I, you know, it's one of my favorite lines. I used it in 10 things, I think, on Monday. I mean, the old Tom Hanks line from Apollo 13, the, the earth is getting bigger it's in the window. The window I mean, it's, I mean, the clock, I mean, you're running out of days here in terms of Brew McCoy being able to, um, you know, you got to have an answer here. Um, I, I, you could go up till game time. They're obviously preparing to have him play, but the longer this thing goes, the more concern you get. Rob, we've been around in Austin. I mean, we've all covered this a long time. We, we've we seen guys who everybody said, yeah, it's going to be fine. It's going to work out. And whether it's basketball or football, that, that you know, those things always seem to take longer than, than anybody thinks they're going to when the process starts. And that certainly feels like the case with Brew McCoy. However, we're still waiting on Etrick Lofton to get here. Still waiting. I mean, so, you know, I mean, the other guys academically, you know, you just never know. And there's appeals process potentially. Uh, there's a USC involvement here with this thing. And, um, it, you know, it's it's a deal where Brew McCoy is looking for a new start. And um, you hope that he gets that opportunity. And Tennessee's certainly hoping that he gets that opportunity because I think he's showing he can play. And, and I think that you're seeing that you're seeing Brew McCoy get comfortable and what little bit we see of him on the practice field, he seems to get better every 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 week, every few days, and, and certainly made some plays in the scrimmage. I mean, I think right now, if if he were eligible, to me, he's your your second guy. He, he's your guy opposite of Cedric Tillman right now because I think he, he's proven that that you know he can go out and make plays. We'll just see if he can get on the field. I'll say this uh, for me for my liking. I understand why one Tennessee, um, you know could be getting to the point of frustration. And then Tennessee fans, I mean, they look up, they see Justin Powell bouncing year to year, and he's eligible. I mean, there, what was the – what was his – and, Rob, I've not read it on this at all. So, um, But what was his reasoning for wanting to be eligible just, all the way across no, the country? I mean, he had no hardship. I mean, the kid's from Kentucky, and he transferred. I mean, and, and, I, and I don't wish Justin any ill will. I'm not you know, going down that road at all. But, I mean, to, to claim a – you know, get a hardship waiver when you, you're from Kentucky – you leave Tennessee, you go to Pullman, Washington, and you're automatically – I mean, I'm glad Justin's eligible. Don't get me wrong, but, but, but you're right. I mean, when Tennessee fans see that and see, like, Brew McCoy, who, who's been here for months and months. Well, and wasn't going to be allowed to compete, Hover, at Southern Cal. You know, wasn't going to be allowed to, to, to be a part of their athletic program. And to me, that's the biggest issue here. If you're not allowed to compete at one school and you can tr transfer – you shouldn't be held up and being able to compete at another. Well, and, and who's doing the holding up, right? I mean, is, is, is it the NCAA doing the holding up? Is the holding up because Southern Cal hasn't taken care of everything they need to? I'm, I'm sure Rob Rick Barnes gave a blessing for Justin Powell to, to, to head on wherever, wherever he was going to head on to at, at some point. And, um, you know, or maybe he didn't, maybe he won some NCAA appeal. I mean, again, if that's the case, then the NCAA should take care of football players first because they're the ones who 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 are, they play first, right? I mean, you, 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 you got you got a chance for basketball to sort through that once you get to the fall. Um, but you know, we'll see. It, it's Tennessee fans have been down this road way too many times, and that's why Tennessee fans get get antsy about this thing. And I, I know on campus there you know there remains optimism that this thing's going to get resolved. Uh, you know, some point here in, in short order, and we'll, we'll see if that's the case. Short order is getting a, long, a little bit longer now because we're 15 days, 16 days into fall camp. Yeah, Tennessee fans are snake bit, for sure. So, obviously, the Brew McCoy situation needing to be resolved the closer you get to kickoff. Austin said kind of the, the 20th was the mile marker for him. Obviously, Tennessee doesn't kick off till the first. but well, I think that's when it really amps up. Like the, yeah. 
the the feeling, the angst, to me, it mm-hmm. really amps up when you get to the twenty. Yeah, I mean, each each day that passes by, I mean, it's it's that that feeling kind of gets larger and larger. So, want to figure out that situation. In the meantime, still trying to figure out who the coaching staff can trust on a consistent basis to play opposite of Tillman if Bruce McCoy can't be in that fold. The left tackle position, obviously, one of major importance on that offensive line. Tennessee returns four or five starting offensive linemen. You have Gerald Mincy, the transfer from Florida. You have J.J. Crawford, who got a little bit of playing time last season, actually started the Music City Bowl at right tackle. Those two guys are competing right now. Josh Heupel asked about it post-scrimmage number two. Here's what Josh Heupel had to say on the left tackle battle between Gerald Mincy and Jeremiah Crawford. Yeah, uh, it's been back and forth a little bit through training camp. Uh, You guys have heard me say this. At the end of the day, we're going to need both of them, all of them. Um, and it just, you know, you, you experienced last year injuries, um, and that's true at the tackle spot. It, it's true on all five spots. Um, those guys are continuing to compete. Um, that's not going to stop after today. That will happen all the way up uh, until kickoff. Anticipate both of them playing uh, during the course of, of the football game throughout the season and certainly in week one. Uh, you know, who gets a majority of that or what the percentage breakdown is, we'll, uh, we'll continue to evaluate as we go through. Both of them have made a bunch of uh, progress from spring ball and, and really since the beginning of train, training camp in, in understanding what we're doing offensively. Uh, in the run game, playing with better pad level, being able to create some, some movement up front. Um, both of them take major strides in, in the pass pro side of it too. So, um, you know, I feel like those guys are continuing to progress as they should. And Brent, one thing that he mentioned right there was asked a follow-up was, you know, the backup plan's always been Darnell Wright's. If you didn't have confidence in one of those two guys, Gerald Mincy or J.J. Crawford, would you toy with the idea of bringing Darnell Wright back to the left side and then bringing up Dane Davis to play right tackle? Josh Heupel pretty much put the clamps on that and said, no, that's not in our our wheelhouse right now. But those two guys continue to battle it out at left tackle. They both had moments throughout fall camp. We both or we all believe that they're both going to play against Ball State. But how do you see that that battle going now towards the, the third week of fall camp? Well, I mean, I I think Josh Heupel basically said in that quote, they're both going to play in in the Ball State game. And and I don't think it's going to be, you know, one guy's just going to play a mop-up duty at the end, Austin. I I think when you talk about, you know, rotation and and guys coming in, I I think that is the one spot on offense you know for sure that in the first half of that football game against Ball State, they're going to rotate and play both those guys because it's not sorting itself out itself out over the next four day block. I don't think anybody's going to run away with the job here at this point. Uh, so you're going to play both those guys, as you have said for months that, that, that would be the case. And I think that's going to be the case. The question is, do they play it that way for the whole month to start the season? Does it sort itself out against ball state? You feel comfortable with more comfortable with somebody going to pit. I think that's the bigger question at this point, because for right now, I think both of them play in the first half against ball state. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I think you're going to see them probably made two series and two series, something like that, um, in, in the first half, and 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 then go from there. And and I, and I think you know, depending on how one is playing versus the other, it will depend on how the rotation goes after that. Well, Tennessee appears to be confident in, in you know what those two guys bring, at least manning that one position. So obviously, we'll have to keep tabs on that up until Ball State and shortly thereafter. Defensively. Seems like defense had a stronger day in scrimmage two than in scrimmage one. Josh Heupel said they did a good job of staying in their lanes. The front seven uh, fitting up the football nicely. Bryce Neeson seemed to be making some plays on the defensive line. Deshaun Rucker, uh, who's not really in the conversation to be a starting cornerback, but when we talk about depth, that's a guy that has played some football and that Tennessee would like to come around. Uh, Brent seems like the defense stepped up and, and did some nice things in scrimmage too. Well, I think that's the Rob. That, that's the Rodney Garner playbook, right? I mean, I, I think that it's about growth and and development throughout camp. We saw that a year ago with his group, and so I don't I don't think it's a surprise that the defensive front and that front seven responded the, the way that they did heading into scrimmage too. Yeah, and the guy that I mean, Josh, Josh didn't really mention him yesterday, but I, I I know Austin has picked it up and for. From his million sources, it sounds like Byron Young is just being a disruptive force. You know, it, when when they go eleven on eleven, I don't know that that how much work he's getting, but when he's on the field, the you know the, the word we're getting that he has really been hard to handle. And you know, I again, you have to read through the lines with with, with Coach, Coach Heupel, but it sounded to me like that, that he felt like the defense had had a pretty good day on Sunday when he, you know he was talking about run fits, he was talking about the secondary. 
you know, working in tandem with with, with the front seven. So I, I'm still going to, you know, they have they have a, a lot to improve on, but I'm I'm cautiously optimistic about that side of the ball being much better. I mean, and again, the second they they were the worst in the SEC last year as far as yards given up passing. They were you know middle of the pack run defense. So you're not going to have to you know exactly reinvent the wheel to to be better on that side of the ball. But but I I'll look for them to really take a step. Yeah, in order to be better against the pass, you've got to get after the quarterback. You mentioned Byron Young. Roman Harrison's going to play a whole lot backing up Byron Young, of course, there on the edge. But two freshmen that we mentioned all the time, a lot in recruiting. And now uh, here in fall camp, Joshua Josephs, as well as James Pierce, starting to kind of get things, uh, the game slowing down. They're getting the defense, getting some reps sporadically with the ones, starting to look good. I think Tennessee, Austin, is is hopeful that they can count on some of these these freshman edge rushers to get after the quarterback in passing situations. Yeah, again, can they give him 15 snaps a game? You know, I mean, I, I, unrealistic thinking, anything more than that's gravy or somebody's got injured, which, you you know, you don't want to have happen if you're Tennessee. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, those guys are are picking it up. Joshua Joseph's a little bit ahead of James Pierce, but from all accounts, Hubbard, James Pierce uh, maybe responded a little bit to that yesterday with just, you know, a, I guess a, a better better scrimmage than he had scrimmage one. Yeah, and, and I think for a lot of those guys, a lot of those young guys, it, it's about the ability to first and foremost manage the tempo of the offense that they're going against. And and I, I know they go against it every day in practice, but it's different when it's in a scrimmage setting uh, because there, there's enough coaches milling around, you know, close to the huddle and, and not, not, a, not off on the side completely away from everybody. Uh, to help those guys get going and, and and all those things. Now it's different. You know, you're on the far side of the field. You, you got to get the call. You got to find the signal. It's different than a coach standing there hollering at you where you can hear him on the practice field. So I, I think the tempo bothered the defense more in scrimmage one than it did in scrimmage two, I think particularly for the young guys. And, and I think that's part of the game slowing down for Joshua Joseph and, and for James Pierce. It's, the, it's becoming – it's learning the habit of, hey, I just made a play – I don't have time to, you know, slap everybody on the helmet and strut around or look around or catch my breath. I've got to immediately turn, get a call, and get lined up. And and I think that's part of why the defense, that why their fits were better on Sunday because I think they were lined up better. I think they were ready to play between snaps um, better in the second scrimmage than they were in the first scrimmage. I think that was the same case a year ago. I think that'll be a very normal trend uh, under a Josh Heupel team. Uh, just because that offense goes so fast, it's hard to mimic it outside. It's different in scrimmage settings than it is in regular practice settings, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I think, Rob, um, and that's something I noticed when covering spring practice the first year with Josh Heupel here is, you know, in, in routes on air, the receivers would catch the ball, and at the, tar- at the time it was Cody Burns, and he was screaming at him, get the football to the official, get the football to the official, just learning – you know, you got to line up and snap, you know, you got to, got to play the next snap defensively. The same thing. You don't have time to celebrate. You got to get back on the line of scrimmage. Looking at the secondary now, I feel like this coaching staff, Willie Martinez, Josh Heupel's made comments. They, they feel better about the options they have, but something we've been discussing all off season, healthy competition. How many corners do you really have now? How, what's the competition like at the star position? Well, I think that question has been answered. There is a competition there with Tamari McDonald, Wesley Walker. Walker, a guy who can also spell the two veteran safeties back there at either free or strong. And then, and then at cornerback, you know, Christian Charles is back there practicing, got his red jersey off. Warren Burrell, of course, Brandon Turnage. And a guy that's stepping up here lately is a junior college transfer, D. Williams. It seems like from the comments and a little bit that we see at practice that there is some of that good, healthy competition that we were talking about all offseason long. I think there's totally competition. I mean, I think you got five corners that, I mean, you didn't mention Kamal Hedden, who's, mm-hmm. you know, Right there, when he's when he's practicing, is is definitely in the mix. You mentioned the star guys. To me, the most, I mean, I, I don't think anything's really settled there. But I think oh, three or four of those corners could play. Two or three of the guys guys at star could play. Is anybody? I mean, is there really competition at safety? Hubbard, what do you? I mean, or McCullough and and Flowers, are they there? Are they starting no matter what? Or is Martinez really given somebody like? Turrentown or Walker or, or Rucker or whoever is anybody getting a look besides well, those two guys? Yeah, it's a great, I mean, it's a great question. I, I think we've all said, you know, Willie Martinez is about his veterans and he's always going to be about his veterans. Remember this now, Tim Banks coaches those safeties every day. 
Yeah, he's individually. the one that call. I mean, he, he's the one coaching those safeties. So where Tim Banks falls in with it and, and all those things, I, I don't know. I, I'll say this. My guess for the starting secondary going into uh, the Ball State game is going to be Christian Charles and Warren Burrell at corner, uh, to Marion McDonald at star, and McCullough and Flowers at, at safety. But I do think they'll play more bodies in week one to kind of see where they can – who has the trust and who they believe in and, and all those types of things. And I do think that they want to play guys less than 800 snaps a yeah. season like they did a year ago. Uh, but, um, again, you keep hearing the trust factor, trust factor. If you don't have trust in the back end, that can end up being a 70-yard touchdown. Uh, that's different than a guy missing a fit, you know, at nose tackle. You know, you 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 screw it up on the back end and somebody's band's going to be playing and it's not yours. So, um, I, I think that we'll see them experiment with some guys in, in week one in terms of who they trust. We're not going to know who they trust, in my opinion, till, till the Pittsburgh game. Then we'll know who they trust at what all positions is when you get into that Pittsburgh game and you're on the road and you're playing against a good opponent. Um, I think you'll see them play a ton of bodies in week one. Then we'll see how it sorts itself out a- after that. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's kind of the way I see it. But I think they'll, they'll start the veterans in the secondary. And something awesome pointed out on the two minute drill Sunday afternoon. You know, it's, it's some guys who have been out for a little bit. It's it's now August the sixteenth. You know, you, if you if you don't want to get left behind, you got to get back out there on the practice field. And I know that you know it's different variations of injuries and and all that. But you know, Kamal Haddon's missed a lot of time here lately. Elijah Simmons has missed a lot of time here lately. Uh, Jalen Wright needs to be getting some contact and full go here before that first game. So. Um, you know, big week coming up as as fall camp kind of ends towards the end of this week, and then you start getting into game like week prep. Uh, they're going to do two different game week like preps, of course, a, a Friday to Friday for a Saturday game, and then obviously for a game week for that Thursday night's uh, kickoff for Ball State. So plenty of coverage. Fall camp continues. All that rolls on this week. But Austin Price also a major recruiting weekend here on a Sunday and, and a Monday. Tennessee two quarterback commits, twenty one overall commits in the class. Ricky Gibson and uh, Jordan Matthews pledge to uh, the Big Orange. Yeah, huge two-day span, especially for the secondary for Willie Martinez. Um, Ricky on Sunday, and then, you know, the biggest of all on this Monday, uh, or on yesterday on, on the Monday, Jordan Matthews, you know, pulls the trigger, shocks Texas. Um, everybody had been touting Texas for so long, and – I kept telling everybody Tennessee's in this more than, than people realized. I mean, he really enjoyed his visit here back in June. Um, and, and then just built a really good bond with the staff built bond with the guys committed to this class. And, um, that Texas trip at the end of July, everyone thought it was to kind of finalize things, but it was to finalize things for Tennessee. He went there to make sure his feelings about Tennessee were right. And he walked away and, New Tennessee was the pick and kept it quiet. Kudos to him, man. Didn't talk to me. Didn't talk to anybody ahead of time. Uh, kind of kept it quiet. And, uh, you know, uh, not many kids do that. And I, and I have a great appreciation for it. Yeah. I mean, it's tough to do in, in today's recruiting, you know, not to get any crystal balls or, or let it slip or anything like that. So yeah, kudos to him. You look at that secondary now, Austin, three safeties and three corners, six overall defensive backs, You've got 12 or 13 defensive commits. I lost count, but 21 overall commits. I think Tennessee looks like they might. I mean, of course, there are going to be new names emerge, and they can go and they attack the transfer portal. But in the secondary, you look to be pretty set right now, very balanced, and some guys that you wanted for a long time now jumping in the boat. Yeah, I mean, Sylvester Smith, Auburn's going to continue to, uh, you know, recruit there. They're going to keep trying to swing him. And, you know, we'll see if anything happens. Um, you know, I mean, I still think Tennessee has a really good chance to, to hold on to him. I'm just saying Auburn, as the local team, is going to continue to lean on him. You have to, you know, even though you got Jordan Matthews in the boat, LSU's not going to go away there. They're right in town. I mean, he, he, they're going to have to hold on to that one. Jack Luttrell has been rumored as a D commit for months back and forth and never, never, never has done so, um, you know, and, and continues to recruit kids to Tennessee. But, you know, there's enough chatter out there. You have to be cognizant of it. So you can't just not recruit DBs. You can't, you know, you, you can't, you know, Tennessee's still going to recruit Aaron Gates, the Florida commit. They're going to recruit, you know, potentially some other safeties just in case a spot comes available. 
Looking ahead to, of course, I know you just spoke on the defensive backfield as well, but kind of closing this recruiting segment out, offensive tackle, defensive tackle, exterior on the offensive line, interior on the defensive line. Those are obviously points of focus. New names will emerge. Things will change between now and December. But obviously, if there's a there's a lot of guys in this in this class right now, 21. But those are the positions that you're obviously targeting, and you got to get help from before signing day. No, uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, whether it's going to the portal or reevaluating some senior film, or going after some guys that maybe you missed out on the first time around that are willing to look around again. Um, yeah, defensive line, offensive tackle. That's where Tennessee wants to to hit up. And then you know, again, best available. Tennessee's not going to turn around, turn away a really good player, even if they are semi full at a position. Um, you know, just kind of see where it goes from there. He's Austin Price, Brett Hubbs, Rob Lewis. I am Eric Kane. Thanks so much for listening to this edition of the Smoky Mountain Organics VolQuest podcast. Three locations in East Tennessee, including one right here in Knoxville, 8018 Kingston Pike, across the street from the Trader Joe's. And, of course, you can always shop online at SmokyMountainOrganics.com. Camp is still rolling on. Plenty of info on the front page, VolQuest.com, the general quarters. And, of course, subscribe, follow us on YouTube by searching VolQuest on YouTube. Thanks so much for listening. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday, everybody. You've been listening to the VolQuest podcast every week here on VolQuest.